born and grew up not far from here. Um, I grew up near the top of Mountain View Avenue at number four, Creef Road. And so it's just a few chains from here. And as a young man, most of this area um, had these beautiful homes. Of course, we were never allowed to enter these premises. We admired them at a distance. I didn't know or imagine that one day I would be sitting up here inside of this beautiful home. I've heard a lot about the Temple of Light uh, since it began. My mother and father worshipped, or I should say fellowshiped, here with you. And my cousin Jean Barnes, where is Jean? Jean introduced them to the teachings of science of mind. So, in a sense, this is a kind of homecoming for me. And when John invited me to share this time with you, I, um, I warmly accepted I would hope that Jamaica would have more occasions where we can see Garvey and his teachings in, in a fuller amplitude, as I will try to make clear this evening and tomorrow morning. When I read in the announcement that this evening would be called Garvey's Spiritual Pathways to Success, I was, I was struck because in 1983, in the first volume of what has been up to now 13 volumes of the Marcus Garvey and UNIA papers. In 1983, believe it or not, in a bold headline on the page, I wrote, Garveyism, this is a direct quotation from the page, Garveyism as the religion of success. I wondered whether you had seen this, John, and had plagiarized the idea. Only one man <laughs> Because it's so remarkably close. Uh, I'm going to read you just a section uh, from my introduction, the section entitled Garveyism as the Religion of Success. <clears throat> Along the way, inevitably, you make a number of discoveries. Isn't that true? Some are lesser are of lesser significance than others. But this idea of Garveyism as the religion of success, I would dare to say, must rank as one of the most significant of my discoveries as a historian of the Garvey movement. As I think about this 
today, it's very clear to me that I would not have made this discovery had I not gone to America. It was in America that I made this discovery. And I'm still puzzling over what steps led me to make this important discovery. But what began for me as the sudden consciousness of Garvey's teaching of success morphed into the discovery of Garvey and his assimilation of the metaphysical teachings of new thought. In other words, Garvey as an exponent of the gospel of success was simply a way station into the deeper template of new thought as undergirding uh, his teaching. Now, I would beg your permission to say something about the recent attempt in Jamaica to introduce the philosophy of Marcus Garvey into the school system. And I think Professor Rupert Lewis um, had a hand in it in so far as he helped to guide the preparation of the material. I, I was very sympathetic to the effort, but I knew secretly how difficult it would be for the people involved in it. And I think one of our colleagues who has since gone on Beverly Hamilton, praise be her name, Beverly had a role in the preparation of the material. The problem with the material when I eventually got hold of it was the realization that what they were trying to teach was the metaphysics of Garvey, but without naming it. And that became a burden uh, for the material. Garvey had a clear metaphysical side to his philosophy. And he had a political side to his philosophy. And if what you are trying to teach children in school is the philosophy of Marcus Garvey, it follows you have to tell them about the metaphysics of Garvey. And without doing that, It, it becomes just a, a miscellany of different teachings. Now those of you here who are familiar with New Thought know that there is a pedagogy of New Thought. And that pedagogy has been tested and tried and that was the pedagogy that Garvey himself utilized in what he called his lesson, his lessons in African philosophy. I point, I point that out to center 
what I'm trying to say in the here and now, in the present, in the Jamaican here and now, in the Jamaican present. Okay, so permit me then to read to you a section from my introduction of 1983, Garveyism as the Religion of Success. Quote, as the evangel of the gospel of black success, Garvey's program of racial self-determination conceptualized and instituted an important political variation on the white norm of success, on the white norm of success. Quote, I have been trying to lift men out of themselves, Garvey declared, calling upon his racial compatriots with his famous injunction, quote, look up, you mighty race. Something else strikes me. In 1960 or 61, the assistant masters and mistresses uh, organized a national essay competition in Jamaica. And I had the temerity to enter the competition and submit an essay. My beloved Uncle Frank, uh, who I was very, very attached to, he was in a profound way my mentor. One day I was with him at his house and he pulled out of his typewriter uh, a special editorial contribution to the Daily Gleaner. And he said, here, read this. I read it. I read it because everything he wrote was always so beautifully written. And I learned a lot from him just by appreciating how much he put into his writing. And I turned to him when I was finished reading it and I said to him, Uncle Frank, is this man a Jamaican? He said, yes. And it's his birthday coming up. I think it was that same week. And it was a, an appreciation of Garvey on his birthday. And I, I said, this man is a Jamaican? He said, yes. Well, I had never heard the name Marcus Garvey. Not once. And I, you might say, could consider myself a relatively educated student. And I realized then and there what a great job the British colonialists had done on us. In other words, I had been superbly miseducated into my own identity. So I leave Uncle Frank and I go to my school at St. George's and on the Monday they passed around a note to the sixth form and it said you're invited to consider submitting an essay. And there were three topics. This is 1960. There were three topics that you could write on. And the third topic was the name Marcus Garvey. And I said, what the hell? 
That's the same name that Uncle Frank showed me his essay on. And almost as a dear, I said, let me try this. Secretly, I wanted to do something that would impress my Uncle Frank. But also, maybe to find out if the answer to the question, was he really a Jamaican? Because the idea that anybody from this yard could go foreign and make such history was stunning to me. And we knew practically, I knew nothing about this man. Well, it was in order to write this essay, which I would enter into the competition, that I first discovered in the West India Reference Library at East Street. That's how I first went to the reference library. Now, the, the Li National Library of Jamaica. And that has been my history since 1960. I've been trying to find out about this man, Marcus Garvey, introduced to me by my uncle Frank. Well, the, type, the reason I tell you this story is that the title of that young boy's essay contribution was look up up you mighty race that was the title i had chosen and reading it here reminded me of that the essay won the national competition and the judge thank you thank you the judge was Monsignor Gladstone Wilson. How fitting. It's all coming together, you see. And Mr. Um, Mr. White, who was Garvey's secretary, when Garvey was here in Jamaica, Mr. Eustace White called my home and he said, we're trying to find Robert Hill. I said, here I am speaking to you. He said, you're the Robert Hill who wrote the essay? I said, yes. He said, tell me who your father is said, my father is Stephen Hill. And <laughs> he said to me, you have an uncle named Ken Hill and Frank Hill? I said, yes, they're my uncles. And Mr. White said to me, oh, then we understand. It's clear why you wrote such an essay. Mr. White was the man who introduced the Baha'i faith here in Jamaica, by the way. I left Jamaica and went away to England. And while I came back, the first summer that I came back, Mr. White was right. He was a carpenter with the most magnificent tough hands I've ever seen or felt. He rode a bicycle and his workshop was in Torrington, a Torrington bridge. And he was riding up the Hope Road on his bicycle and a truck knocked him off the bicycle and killed him. When I explain to people how I came to Marcus Garvey. 
they think I sat in the library and read about Garvey. My pathway to Garvey is through the liberty, the liberty of my own family, my people, they're the ones who pointed me towards Garvey. So let me continue. The success ideal was always central to Garvey's racial perspective. And the ideology of the American cult of success exerted a profound influence on the evolution of his program for racial independence. Furthermore, Garvey's guiding philosophy was entirely in accord with the long-standing African-American struggle to succeed despite years of white opposition. This identity of aim might explain in part the immediacy with which black Americans gravitated toward the program of the UNIA. This tradition of success went back quite far as attested to by the fact that the home reading libraries of many black Americans from the turn of the 19th century onward included a significant number of success manuals produced by black authors such as James Haley's The Sparkling Gems of Race Knowledge Worth Reading. Garland Penny, Afro-American Home Manual and Practical Self-Education, showing what to do and how to do it, being a complete guide to success in life. Finally, what Merle Curti, the historian, has termed, quote, the cult of getting ahead through one's efforts, quote, close quote, was the doctrine retailed by Garvey in frequent exhortations, such as this Negro World editorial headline of October 1, 1921. Quote, Negro must climb in, climb in the achievement of higher things. Race must conquer the Alps of oppression. There should be a will not to surrender. Negro should feel himself a sovereign human being. Man should harness the elements and nature and use them to his will. In another editorial in the Negro World of 11 October 1919, William Ferris underscored the radical significance of Garvey's translation of the doctrine of business success into a new belief in emancipation for black Americans. Quote, what we want is another emancipator who will tell the Negro youth, quote, you can succeed in big business just as you have succeeded along other lines of intellectual and mechanical endeavor. If you study business as you study the other subjects and trades and learn the detail necessary to success, you can even sail the high seas and run a steamship line. In his promotional pamphlets and speeches, Garvey not only quoted at length from F. Elbert Hubbard, American author of the popular and influential success manuals, A Message to Garcia and Health and Wealth, but he recommended a degree of discipleship. This is Garvey now 
writing, quote, get a copy of Hubbard's scrapbook. Ask any publisher in your town to get it for you. It contains invaluable inspiration, close quote. In 1922, a Negro Factories Corporation advertisement for shares declared that, quote, enthusiasm is one of the big keys to success, averring that, quote, from the time Marcus Garvey was 20, he held an enthusiastic vision of great accomplishment for himself and his race. In a 1921 editorial entitled, quote, The Person Who Succeeds, veteran black journalist and later editor of the Negro World, T. Thomas Fortune wrote, Quote, in his front page article in the Negro World last week, President General Marcus Garvey talks about success. Is this not a splendid picture to frame in the mind and shape the conduct by? We think it is, close quote. Garvey's inspirational maxims appeared regularly on the cover of each issue of The Black Man, his final publication, edited in Jamaica and later in England, reinforcing the mind power credo of the success cult. Quote, be a man by doing the deed of men. Black man, what is in thy bosom? Pluck it out. Is it genius? Is it talent for something? Let's have it. Garvey's poems were couched in the same idiom. Quote, go and win. Find yourself. Be a king of circumstances. In like fashion, a front page article in Garvey's Black Man newspaper published in Jamaica declared in the headline, quote, let us give off success and it will come. As man thinks, so is he. What I discovered in Jamaica was that, discovered in America, is that Garvey had absorbed and assimilated this tradition of success and its literature and reworked it and presented it to a black audience and they soaked it up. The problem is that we in Jamaica don't know very much about, at least we know more now than we did then, certainly in the 70s and 80s, that this highly developed, highly developed gospel of success doesn't mean the everyday meaning of success. It means a spiritual grasp of the philosophy behind the ethic of success. And that is what Garvey mastered. And that's why he could never be defeated. Because when you lock on to that concept, nothing can defeat you. Well, I have always wanted to have sharing a discussion on Garvey with you because uh, your work over the past nearly five decades, in fact, five decades, 
I'm trying to remember when you did graduate work in the Department of Government, what year did you start out? 1967. 1967, fine. So it's over 50 years, and you did a thesis, master's thesis, on the Garvey movement. So, uh, Roberts, if you don't mind me calling you Bobby, um, we worked together outside of the context of the research on Garvey with the Abeng newspaper in 1969. And that's 49 years ago. Bobby and Diane typesetting the newspaper Abeng, uh, who is seated here, Bobby's wife. And um, in most issues of the Abeng newspaper, there were quotations from Garvey, which Bobby inserted into the Abeng newspaper. And there's a quotation that Garvey used, we want our people to think for themselves. And that's one of the quotations I wanted you to identify. Um, not now, but it's one of the things which comes back to me in thinking about Garvey, is the role he played in insisting on our intellectual capabilities. And I think in this respect, the, I agree with what Bobby has said about the religion of success. When I first read it, in nine, when it, the, well, not volume one, right? When volume one came out, I was a little skeptical of the idea of religion of success. Um, but I later came to an understanding of what it meant and why the American experience was so important for Garvey and his thinking. I don't think that that could have emerged here. It's not likely that it could have emerged here. Not only because of the literature that wasn't here, but also because of the context. In the colonial context, you're dealing with a very circumscribed intellectual, political, social, and economic situation. And you're dealing with the British ministers of religion in the Anglican Church, in the Methodist Church, in the Baptist Church. And the Baptists in particular thought that they had brought emancipation to the people. Quite a misguided view. And Garvey had a big debate in 1921, which you have there in volume seven. Um, not volume seven, I think it's the early volume, volume three, uh, where Agave is involved in a debate with Ernest Price. And he's basically saying, Ernest Price was headmaster of Calabar, he is basically saying, if these guys did all this good, that it was their responsibility because they introduced slavery, they were responsible for the transatlantic slave trade. So I mention this because the Jamaican context offers variation. However, in the new Jamaican newspaper, every issue, there was a sermon or a statement by Garvey, which was in keeping with new thought, with motivation. And this motivation also was evident in the person I knew best, which is Garvey's second wife, Amy Jakes Garvey. Um, and in the Black Power era, when she did a, a pamphlet on the Black Power movement, she insisted on an essay called The Power of the Human Spirit. And that links up with what Bobby has been saying. I think that the, Bobby is right in highlighting the metaphysics because it is the metaphysical thinking of Garvey in the face of tremendous odds which allows him to transcend. So I wanted to ask you, to what extent is this in Garvey's thinking a form of transcendent, transcendentalism? How would you, how would you 
locate Gabi within that particular framework? Uh, very interesting question. Oh, sorry. Th thank you for that commentary. Your question regarding transcendentalism, that name, transcendentalism, designates an American philosophy of the middle of the 19th century, most closely identified with the American social philosopher, Ralph Waldo Emerson. The transcendentalists are closely identified with the precursor movement preceding new thought. Transcendentalism is one of the tributaries or streams of intellectual philosophical influence that fed into new thought. See, that term, that designation, new thought, only came about in the 1890s, but the sources of new thought begin sometime in the 1830s. Among some of the precursors were not only the transcendentalists, but the mesmerists and the great Danish uh, idealist and religious philosopher, Swedenborg. The, the influences that fed into New Thought that would eventually become named New Thought were very varied. Yes, transcendentalism is one of the major component influences of New Thought and the credo of success, but let me be even more specific. The reason that the idea of success could and did develop in the United States into such a major, major literary um, movement is because of the emphasis on individualism in American life. The success philosophy is the philosophical expression of American individualism. Here in colonial Jamaica, the individual never, never got no attention. Think about that. The individual was not something, at least in my schooling in Jamaica, did people talk about and write about the individual. Today, it, I'm going out on a limb here, it's a drag on our politics. Because if anything, individualism, we are a what? in Jamaica with individualism, the creativity of the individual. But it has yet to receive a political expression. Well, in America, they have a whole national philosophy based on individualism. It's the American credo. And what I stumbled upon by being in America was that, oh, this is where Garvey got it from. We are all of us exchanging ideas and influences. That's par for the course. That's perfectly natural. The question is what you do with it. Garvey took something he found in America and took it to a great height so that Americans don't even recognize that 
Garvey was perhaps the greatest modern exponent of the American credo. Okay, there are two things which come to mind. Is the, when a black man embraces success in the United States, what are the implications for that black person of the embrace of what is a deeply held credo? And I agree with you on individual, with individualism, that that is at the heart of what drives American society, politics, and business. Uh, but what are the pitfalls, so to speak? And this is probably a two leading a question. Can I already no. answer it? No, it's a perfectly legitimate question. Can he succeed or she succeed? Yes, uh, to a degree, you know, that we in the colonial British Caribbean never succeeded. When Garvey went to America in 1916, he wrote his impressions of America between 1916 and 1918. And Garvey wrote and said it. And I eventually, towards the end of his life, he came back around to it. That the African American can teach us in the Caribbean about getting stuff done. Garvey said, look at their shops, look at their newspapers, look at their schools and colleges. They have, they have a highly developed social culture of achievement. Diane and I lived in Chicago, well, Evanston, just north of Chicago, in the mid-1970s. And one night, the honorary Jamaican consul invited us, I think it was a Jamaican independence celebration, and we drove down into Chicago and there were hundreds of people there. And as I was introduced and met various people, I realized these African Americans, if you, if you put them in charge of a mid-sized country, they would have no trouble running it. They have so much capital, so much, um, they have so much experience of modernity. That is exemplified in what Garvey said about how we, the West Indian, Garvey said we can learn about wearing clothes from the African American. Look at how they wear their clothes, he said. In other words, in, many, in, in, in a profound way, Garvey saw the African-American as a model upon which to pattern yourself. Now, in America, they have to keep that within their group. That's the limitation. And the philosopher of how to do that was Booker T. Washington, the sage of Tuskegee. And it was to him that Garvey had gone to America to see, to visit, because when he wrote him from Jamaica, he encouraged Garvey to come and visit him at Tuskegee. Well, it's a, it's a dangerous tightrope walk you're a black American, and you are trying to express yourself, but the society, Richard Wright, the famous African-American novelist, had a, a wonderful way of encapsulating this dilemma. Richard Wright said, you wake up every morning and you look in that mirror and you ask yourself, 
am I the one that's out of step? Or are the others in step? And I'm the one that's out of step. It's a hell of a thing to feel that you're the odd man out because it can crush, crush your spirit. But at the same time, it provides an impetus to great human achievement. And also, the society proclaims its belief in the power of the individual and by God we're going to hold them to account. In other words, America can run but it can't hide. You can't on the one hand say you believe in the gift of the individual, the right of the individual, but deny it. Sooner or later, something has to give. When I was in Chicago, I remember upsetting the man who was the chairman of my department. Because round about that time, Muhammad Ali had proclaimed himself, I am the greatest. And I said to him one night, we were getting into some cups. I said to him, you're a black man, right? He said, yes. I said, how can you claim on the one hand? How can you honestly say, I'm the greatest? And you're a black man. This society says that don't, doesn't compute. And he was very upset with me. Rightly so. I was a West Indian presuming to teach him about how to be black in America. In other words, I was implying the limitations of blackness. So it's, it's a struggle that never ends. Okay, I'd like to, before opening up to the audience, um, my final question or comment would be 2008, 10 years ago, big economic crisis that wrecked millions of people and their success. People who had been given mortgages and found that they couldn't pay. Thousands yeah. of people lost their homes. So the question is, how do you, how does metaphysical thought handle economic realities? Not, not only economic realities, how does metaphysical thought handle race? Ah! Yeah, well, that's what you just dealt with, so I, I want to come back to the 2008, because the entire Caribbean was affected by this. And Barbados now is going through what Jamaica went through earlier on in that decade. So it's a profound, it's not an American thing, it's a Caribbean and other parts of the world because of the huge size and importance of the American economy. But let me come directly and say, success and capitalism, how do you deal with that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, capitalism has been the world's most successful economic system. No two ways about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. By any measurement, it has been a powerful success, a powerful experiment. But that doesn't mean that it can satisfy all of our human needs to the extent that the success of capitalism 
now eats itself, destroys itself. The system lurches from crisis to crisis. Um, and again, that story, the, the full story has not been told. However, what capitalism does is it disciplines you. If you don't work, you will not eat. If you don't work, you will not have. That disciplining can also be turned to the disciplining of thought. I believe that the success of new thought has come about because it figured out a way to discipline your deepest inner urges and ideas and feelings. You marshal those thoughts into a powerful statement of the self. The, the thing about new thought that has its greatest appeal for me is the teaching of the loving self. The loving self. Where there is love, conquers everything. Okay? i leave you on that. Okay. Um, I just wanted to clarify something. Bobby, you gave me too much credit for the Garveyism in schools. I take no credit for it. I have prepared no material. Oh, I um, thought you were. No, no, no. I, that's... Uh, mistaken view. So I give others that, uh, that credit. Uh, but your point though, which is really the important one, is that the metaphysical aspects of Garvey's thinking, and there's so much that he wrote and spoke, and so much that is in some of the volumes, as well as in certainly the Negro world and in the New Jamaican, that there isn't, there is a very serious challenge in linking the metaphysics with the politics to get the two integrated into a central, the central core of Garvey's message. And that's not an easy no. task to accomplish. You can write the narratives of different, you know, the chronological aspects and so on. But the link between the metaphysics and the politics, I think those two are uh, at the core of what it means to teach Garvey in the educational system and outside. But I wanted to open up to the audience for... Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Professor Hill, Professor Lewis, um, you know, really learned so much from what you said. And my question is about Garvey's father, because we, I keep hearing about him going to his room at the back with his books. And if I have to get a time machine, I want to know what were those books, because I, I wonder, were they, what were those books? Were there some new thought books? Was it what? What were those books? Do we have any idea? I uh, thank you for the question, sister. What's your name? I'm sorry, Jeanette. 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 Thank you for that question, Mr. Garvey, Senior. What a man! Um, I can't tell you the titles any of the titles of books that would have been in his library, except to point out that St. Anne's Bay 
in the late 19th century, early 20th century, was a vibrant port that was connected through the United Fruit Company to Boston. Boston was one of the centers of new thought and new thought therapeutics or the science. I do believe that these books, pamphlets, were published in their millions and Boston was one of the great publishing centers in the United States. I believe that the ships that came into St. Anne's Bay, they left with our bananas, but I think they dropped off. Merchandise, and among the merchandise would have been books and pamphlets. Marcus Garvey's father, like his son would become, was a great reader. Well, where is he going to be getting material at this time at a price point that he could afford? Moreover, the old people who I interviewed back in the late 60s and early 70s in St. Anne's Bay told me that on Sunday, Mr. Garvey Sr. was the sexton of the Wesleyan Church in St. Anne's Bay. And on Sunday after church, he, he would have come to visit him all of these men who would come to debate different aspects of religion. And they said that Mr. Garvey relished a discussion on religion. This was how our forebears, our ancestors in Jamaica, trained themselves to think. Through religious debate, they developed a powerful way of articulating themselves. Now, I have to believe that some of the elements of what became known as New Thought philosophy filtered into St. Anne's Bay. But let me also say that Mr. Garvey Sr. was also regarded as an obia man. <laughs> I, I press people to ask them, why are you calling him an obia man? Well, he had a very idiosyncratic diet. He ate certain things that nobody else would eat. And he had these supernatural beliefs. And finally, he was a master mason and one of the things that he did was that he built tombs for people when they died. You with me? Yeah. All right. In other words, Marcus Garvey's father, I wish Barry was here, he could tell us about the indigenous philosophy. Each of these systems words, beliefs that coming up out of the soil, personal health, all of these things were swirling around. You might say that Marcus Garvey Jr. in many ways resembled his father in terms of certain peculiarities and his gift with language and with words. Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you. We should thank the Temple of Light for inviting these scholars to lighten our historical darkness. And since we are in a religious space, just to ask Professor Hill if he would share with us a misconception with regard to the Methodist Church and the, you know, that question that was asked of you about the child with whom Garvey yes. was playing. You remember yes. that story? Yes. Yes, yes. okay. <laughs> it was a Eureka experience. Uh -huh. um, Marcus Garvey, growing up at Winders Hill, at the, at the back of St. Anne's Bears, you start the steep ascent when you're leaving uh, the clock tower. Marcus Garvey, his family home was Cater Corner, uh, 